What's good with everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Get The Who's Podcast. It's been a while since we've done a pod. We're officially in season. I'm one of the worst content creators ever, but we're back. Episodes are, are going to be coming back on Mondays and Thursdays, but we're officially here to discuss the Detroit Pistons. That's right. On episode 42 of the podcast, we're going to be officially breaking down Pistons basketball. And I'm joined here today by passionate content creator and ball knower slash ball watcher of the Detroit Pistons. Don, say what's up to the people. And I'm happy that we're doing this because I'm a Detroiter as well. So we get to talk about the team. What's going on, man? Yeah, what's up? Uh, I mean, it's good to finally be on the pod. You know, we've been trying to do this for like, it feels like months now, probably. <laughs> But yeah, no, I mean, I'm just glad to have uh, you having me on. Of course, it's an honor. You know, I'm a diehard Pistons fan. Uh, I'm a contributor for the Pistons Fleet uh, platform. You guys should check us out at PistonsFleet.com. We have great articles over there. Um, we do post game spaces. Um, so it's something you guys should definitely check out if you are interested in the Detroit Pistons. Definitely go check out Pistons Fleet. I want to say I went to the Golden State versus Pistons game the other night. And I was literally in the spaces listening to a Cade Cunningham hater, which had irrational hate, which we'll get to those expectations and all that. But definitely go tap in. As far as this podcast, it's been a a while, guys. But again, we're live on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also YouTube for the video version. So if those things interest you, make sure to tap in, get the hoops on all platforms. But without further ado, let's get right into it. So initially... For the offseason, this is something that I have been planning for the Detroit Pistons. I am excited about the vision of the team. I know that that there's some fans that are not. They want instant results. How I have viewed it is Detroit has been a franchise that for some time has not been able to hit in the draft and hasn't had like a idea of where to go, right? So to me, when they drafted Cade, I looked at it as Cade based on his talent and how good he is like he is the idea to me of what true versatility is right like size and skill at every position and Cade definitely has that type of sense to him now this kind of segues to the conversation that we had in your fleet right where Mm -hmm. people for whatever reason expect Cade to be elite in his third season where if we remember, he played like 60 plus games his rookie year. He played all of seven games in his sophomore year. But for whatever reason, sorry, for whatever reason in year three, he's expected to be like this Anthony Edwards type of player where like he's had games and reps. In my opinion, once K gets the reps, like the true vision of what Detroit is trying to accomplish is going to shine out. And we've seen other great standouts, but I really want to get your thoughts and what your patience level is with Cade. So he just played like, I think maybe two games ago, he just played his 82nd game ever. So that's like one NBA season, full NBA season completed. Uh, Last year, he only played 12, like you said. Uh, Right now, I mean, we're only six, seven games into the season. He's obviously uh, coming off that stress fracture uh, injury. He needs to still get his legs up under him. Uh, We see it like in the fourth quarters where he's constantly, you know, uh, his efficiency completely plummets uh, and obviously like the efficiency is definitely a big talking point when we were talking about Cade and expectations and that's probably like the one place where he hasn't really met expectations yet um, but it's really hard to gauge what he is as a player like he's constantly showing you great things uh, being able to create for himself and others plays defense like you said versatile player makes winning pl- he's a very smart basketball player um, yes he turns the ball over a lot yes he's been inefficient but when you look at the situation and the amount of experience he's had he shows you enough good with the bad to where, I mean, I have no reason to still not believe in him. Uh, and I think he has been great considering the uh, the situation uh, this year. I mean, he's playing with 1950 spacing basically this year. You know, it's really unfortunate. <laughs> I don't like that I have to like continually like contextualize his efficiency or his turnovers, but it is really just the truth of the matter. He's getting tripled up teamed on every single possession basically trapped uh nba defenses respect them they know what he is know what he's capable of um and i think eventually the casual nba fan will too um he, they just have to surround him with pieces that complement him and allow him to play his game yeah how i feel about Cade is 
the situation that he's been cast into, I feel like a lot of people don't have a true understanding of. I mean, he was drafted number one overall to a team that for years has had higher draft picks that don't pan out to exactly what they want to be. And with the new head coach in Monty, it's a completely new direction Detroit is going in. And I focus on K because the roadmap of what they want to do is going to go through him based on what his skill set is. And in my mind, I don't think Kate is like single-handedly elite at any one trait, but he's good in multiple different areas and shows a real shine as being a playmaker who can play defense. Like I remember the first Kate Cunningham game I went to where he's playing Orlando and it's like, I don't know what the shooting stuff is, but he's fast, he's quick, and he's just involved everywhere. And defensively, like, he's showing, you know, signs of, hey, I can get steals, I can get blocked, I can get tipped. Like, the effort and motor on both ends is something that really stood out to me. So for me, I really think it's foolish, right, to say a player that just played his 82nd game is now all of a sudden supposed to be like a breakout elite guy just because he was drafted number one overall. The situation you get drafted to matters, your skill set matters, but more than anything, the reps you get at the NBA level matters the most. Because how can you get comfort in understanding what defenses are trying to take away from you, what type of shots you can really have, and your confidence level if you haven't even played enough NBA basketball. That's why for me, I don't really entertain these things with Detroit I'm also here for like the ride especially after seeing what Jalen Duran is and how good he is and how he can fit long term alongside Kate as well like there's a lot of things that the Pistons are trying to figure out so to me piling on Cade is not the answer if you want real change in Detroit I think no I uh, yeah no I couldn't have said it better myself and um yeah I mean it's hard to tell Detroit fans be patient considering how bad things have been for it seems like an eternity now and a lot of those guys that are impatient tend to be you know the guys who watch the bad boys or watch the 04 pistons and you know they're going to work team and stuff like that so they want results right away and uh i mean frankly it just doesn't happen like that especially when a guy misses his entire second year um and given the offensive situation that he's playing in right now so i i hate telling them to be patient but at the end of the day, all you have to do is like wait and see, you know, before saying that, okay, oh, can't do this or Kate can't do that, you know. And I think this is the perfect segue to another player on the Pistons that I have this weird thought of. So what's funny is the number one meme that's trending all over Detroit Twitter is Cade saying, Monty Williams, can I please play in lineups that are offensively competent and Monty saying I want Killian Hayes to marry my daughter <laughs> so Killian Hayes is a player I have to bring up because I feel like a lot of people especially Kevin O'Connor shout out to him wherever he's at but a lot of people thought of Killian Hayes to be like this three level scorer who could play defense great pat like you know like being a really complete player some people viewed him as the franchise player and then he gets in a league and he also has had his fair share of super horrific injuries at times to where he can't play as well and fully develop and it felt like last year towards the end he was starting to like really put things together a bit more in his game but the offense is extremely rough I think he's a great passer he plays good defense but ultimately for Killian I think his roadmap into further developing is going to take more time. For being honest, I look at Killian as a guy that is not going to be great, but I think he can be a phenomenal backup with his talent because he is a real defender. He can play good defense. He, he runs with pace. Even in the game we just watched, I mean, the way that he was dotting up shooters in transition, that's what he does well. I just think when you're talking about his competence offensively, Beyond his skill set, I think it's a confidence thing because sometimes he catches the ball and he's scared to like make a mistake so he doesn't shoot the ball. And yeah. that's that's what leads to people being offensive liabilities. Like 
you know, Ben Simmons, for instance, right? He doesn't want to hurt his team, so he doesn't shoot the ball because he's not confident. But if we know you're not going to shoot the ball, we can send to towards K. We can shade over to K because we know you're not a threat to shoot and we don't respect you. What are your thoughts on Killian Hayes moving forward with this franchise? So, yeah, my thing is, like, I think Killian Hayes and this potential, I mean, like you said, he, he's an uh, excellent passer. He's a good uh, defensive player. But he, I mean, last year, I'm pretty sure he was the least efficient player in the whole entire NBA. He's, I'm pretty sure he's the only player in the NBA to average more shots than points, uh, which is completely an issue. Um, he struggles to create his own shot. Uh, doesn't like to go to the rim, shies away from contact. Um, so he has issues in terms of like creating for himself on the ball and creating advantages for others. So that, so really, I think um, how far he goes, it depends on how far his jump shot goes. So if his jump shot starts falling off the ball, I think it can be a real asset off the ball as, in terms of like a connector. If he's able to like knock down open jumpers and teams actually start respecting him on the perimeter, he can make that extra pass. Um, he plays good defense. He just can't shoot. And he's literally like a non-threat offensively completely on the ball, off the ball. It's been rough to see in moments. Um, but I mean, this year is definitely a make or break year. So if the shot's not falling, if he's not scoring somewhat efficiently this year, I think his time in Detroit would be done. Uh, but so far this season, a few games that we've seen is that Detroit is really trying to see what they have in him still. They're giving him this long leash to play through mistakes play through all the inefficiencies to really see what they have in an asset before just getting rid of them. Cause obviously they still believe in him to a certain extent, but if he's not producing at a certain level, then they have to get rid of him. And I agree with that. It's hard because remember they took him pretty high. So like they obviously want to like yeah, seventh overall, hold. seventh overall. Pick. Yeah. And that's yeah. Troy Weaver's first draft pick. So I don't know if there's a little bit of sentimental stuff with that. You know, it's his first draft pick as a brand new uh, first time GM. But, I mean, uh, yeah, if he's not efficient this year, then uh, it's time to cut ties. I mean, it's year four. Yeah. And, like, I try not to overreact, right? But I always say that for younger players, I give you to, like, year four, year five. Because at that point, year four, year five is pretty much who you're going to be. There are some exceptions to the rule. But for the Absolutely. most part, in those first five years, that really molds who you're going to be as a pro. Um, I think a big part of why they're giving him this chance, though, is because Monty is trying to establish like a defensive like system. And I get that. That sounds great. But when we're talking about cage struggles, when you're playing players like Killian next to him with other bigs who are also like non-spacer slash are not respected from three, that leads to the floor being harder for K to read at times because they don't have to respect many of the personnel that's on the floor. And on top of it, remember, Killian Hayes is playing over Jaden Ivey right now. Yeah. <clears throat> no, yeah, no, I have a lot of, I have some disagreements with the current lineup and the whole idea that they're setting a defensive tone. Um, I get you don't want to allow bad habits defensively, and that's why Jaden Ivey doesn't play a lot of minutes because he's picked up a lot of bad habits defensively that they're trying to break. But I think when you put guys in a terrible offensive situation like you are with the terrible spacing, not only does it hurt Cade, but it hurts Azar, it hurts Killian, it hurts Durin. Because when Cade runs a pick and roll with Durin, they're just crashing the roller. They already know. They're not worried about no shooters. They know what you're going to do. And then Cade dribbles into traffic. He's trapped, triple teams, whatever. He forces a bad pass where he's dribbling into traffic, loses the ball, turnovers have been a result. He leads the league in turnovers right now. Um... And then, like, those guys, I mean, they can't attack in space, right? Because they're just waiting for them in the rim. Like, Azar needs room to cut to the rim. Uh, and it's just all around bad for everyone right now, I think. And I think it actually can cause some bad habits to be picked up offensively. So I think Monty needs to do maybe a better job of balancing that to where we're not allowing guys to pick up bad habits offensively or defensively. We can't allow them to play through bad habits offensively if we're going to not allow them to play through bad habits defensively. I'm very happy that you're putting it like that because while I can respect what Monty is trying to do and I have a ton of respect for like how he builds up his overall basketball systems, right? Like I think structure is good for a team that's really, really young. But at the same time, if your idea is to have players develop to where they go away from flaws 
it's weird to say, okay, defensively, let's make sure that we're all on point, but just be okay with poor spacing in 2023. Like at a certain point, the league at this point is filled with the most talent we've seen for like a very long time. And offense, especially offensive scheming and principles matter just as much arguably as what you do on the defensive end. Because if you don't have like a clear offensive philosophy that makes sense and you're just playing like three guys that can't really space guess what happens your defense has to work harder to make up for your lack of offense yeah absolutely and then also another thing too um i mean it puts a lot of pressure on them defensively too when they're when they're consistently that bad in the half court you know uh it allows teams to get out on the break quicker and um but another thing that should be considered and uh, why i do give some leeway to monty is uh, the injuries that they are currently dealing with. You know, uh, Alec Burks, he played the first few games, but he's out with injury right now. Boyan Bogdanovich hasn't played yet. Monte Morris hasn't played yet. And those two guys could honestly be starters. Um, Monte Morris, notoriously known for not turning the ball over, would absolutely help Cade a ton. Can actually, you know, create his own shot, great for others to a certain extent. He's more of a scoring threat than Killian Hayes, at the very least. Boyan Bogdanovich last year averaged like 22 a game on 60 plus true shooting Hooper. percentage. He was a hooper last Excellent year. Excellent score. That's like the safety valve that Cade needs. That's another issue with the lineup that they're running out there with Cade right now is that Cade is like the only scoring threat offensively. Like, absolutely. Um, so defenses are only worried about Cade Cunningham. And it's, it's definitely an issue. So bringing back Boyan should definitely help that. Uh, bringing back Monte Morris could definitely help some of the turnovers and handling issues to where you're not burning Cade to the, down to the ground by the fourth quarter where he has no legs under him. And then also another thing is, I mean, they do have a young guy that they drafted fifth overall last year that could always be an option to start next to Cade Cunningham to alleviate some of that offensive pressure. I get he needs to be more disciplined defensively, but I mean, at what point do we start to question whether or not you're prioritizing your franchise player and K Cunningham. Yeah, honestly, I think how you said that was perfect because as you said, Cade is the only scoring threat. I even saw it in the game that we saw last night with Detroit and Golden State. I mean, the way that defenses respect Cade is because they understand what he can do from, from a talent level, right? So even when yeah. you have Cade and Durant, again, if they're out there with non-spacers, it limits how productive they can be. And if anything, if you're limiting how productive they can be offensively, you're limiting the ceiling of what this team could be as well. And I don't think that Killian is a unusable player. I think that he could be like a potential guy that can stagger, pass, play make and defend i think that's a great role to play off of the bench for detroit that can make sense but i think for right now not only are they going through these issues but like you said they're injured and bojan i'm sorry you got to give bojan credit because last year from the games that i watched bojan was a flat out bucket he was a good connective passer in the detroit offense and the mm -hmm. spacing the biggest thing is the spacing detroit having spacing on the floor at an elite level shifts what the floor looks like. Now imagine playing Cade and Duran in a space lineup where now it's okay, we can't just tag the roller every single time because if we do that now, we're giving up open opportunities. It makes your offense way more competent. And when that happens, you now take uh, more, sorry, more pressure off of your defense to have to be perfect. Trying to be perfect on defense but having such an inept offense is really backwards to me because again, as you said, you're giving the other team easy transition opportunities if you can't score. If everything is going off the backboard, you're making it easier for the other team and it's really not the best way to really map out a team to me either. I'm with you, Don. The next thing I wanna get into here, so I gotta, listen, I gotta be honest, right? The Thompson twins, the first time I saw them, I was wondering if, if they were like overhyped because there was like a lot of outcry about, oh, they're going to be special. They can they can dunk. They're like super athletic. I saw two guys that are athletic, but aren't really spacers. What could their value really be? How they develop? So I paid attention. And for a source specifically, 
I think we're talking about a guy that could potentially be generational. Now, that's a big name to throw out there. And we've heard that for a lot of Detroit, you know, prospects before. And they were not that. But I feel like from the eye test, it's insane what he does defensively. I mean, the way that he just gets in the people and his knack for rebounding at his size. I mean, listen, 13 rebounds, 12 rebounds, four blocks and four steals the night before Detroit. And the way that he actually tried to score in that game as well. Like, obviously the weaker part of his game is what he does on the offensive end, right? But mm -hmm. seeing how he fits perfectly as like that wing type that can just do everything on defense like a Swiss army knife. And he's so young, you don't see people come in that good defensively in their first year. And I think that if he's able to figure out that corner three point shot at the very least, you're talking about another athletic wing who can play with Cade and be very productive to your defense, which right again, adds to the point of building like this two way type of team. What are your thoughts on him? And what do you think he could do to really improve as a player for this team? Man, I, I love Azar so far. I mean, I love them coming in, but he's already been exceeding expectations. Yeah, he, like you said, he's an absolute monster defensively already. I think he's going to contend for the all defensive team. I think the only thing that's really going to stop him from like maybe making one is the Pistons record. But yeah, no, the fact that he's coming in as a rookie, uh, I mean, everyone knows defense is probably one of the hardest things to learn coming into the league. He walked into the league a great defensive player. That doesn't happen right away. He's averaging, what, 3.4 stocks right now. Absolutely insane numbers. He's putting up stat lines that haven't been put up since, like, Ralph Sampson and Kevin Garnett. Like, he's on the name with these seven-footers. He's 6'6", six, 6'7". Six, six, uh, it's true. He's Every single time he steps on the court, he's, like, the best athlete, usually. His brother might be a slightly better athlete, but besides him, uh, not too many uh, better athletes than Nazar. Um... I think the most slept on thing about his game offensively, though, is his ability to like make quick decisions. The processing yes. speed that he possesses is insane. He makes the, the extra pass in like a millisecond before defenses could even pick up on it. Um, he obviously needs to, you know, improve as a shooter uh, and his handle needs to improve. That's probably what the two biggest swing skills. But um, man, I, I feel like I have like unrealistic expectations for him. Because I expect outlier development to a certain extent with Azar. Just how much he loves the game of basketball. It's all he thinks about. It's all he talks about. It's all he does. Um, and the amount of development that he's already had. like, Because you can watch him from a couple years ago to now. The amount of development that he's already had with his jump shot and with his handle has been super impressive. I know this year so far he hasn't shot the ball well. Um, well, the last two games, I think yesterday he made a three... He was like one for three or one for two. And then the day before that, he made two. Um, he was getting he's not shooting well in the night. season, but it's something that I expect that he is going to be a good enough shooter. And even if he isn't a good shooter, I mean, you see it now. He impacts the game in so many ways. He's just that do-it-all wing that every team wants. And the Pistons were lucky like, well, they weren't lucky because they fell to pick five, but they were lucky that Azar Thompson was an option because that kid has star potential for sure. It's not gas either. Like I sat down and I really watched what he was doing. And it's like I've never seen someone at his size have a nose for the like he knows where the rebound is going and the mm -hmm. effort to go get it through traffic to jump over people to like, you know, like really have like that passion is great. But like you said, the decision making. Normally, if you're coming into the lead, the game is super duper fast. You gotta like basically slow down, process it better. But he seems to make the right play a lot of times when he gets the ball. He doesn't really take too many bad shots. He takes good looks. And he, the passing is something that's also underrated with him. I feel like he's a great connective passer. He can, uh, you know, already attack closeouts at, you know, a athletic level and kick to open shooters but even though he can't shoot the way he finds you know lanes to be impactful by just trying to pressure the rim like even last night versus go to state the amount of times he just took the ball from the three-point line attacked paused and, and attacked again and, and got to the paint again this is him still figuring things out on the fly and it's just 
knowing that his floor defensively is already like arguably all defensive level in his first year is great and from this perspective i'll say i think the injuries might have helped him here because he's playing 37 minutes in a lot of these games like high level minutes and mm -hmm. he's getting early nba reps i think partially because of those injuries even more than maybe he would regularly get if everyone was healthy so from that perspective i think that's helped us see more of what he could be but it's clear that like he's gonna be in this team's future with Cade and Jalen Duran. I think he's that good yeah since you brought up the Golden State game too last night and how he was attacking the rim like I'd say even that right there is like a new development with him he was like much more patient at like going to the rim and and not rushing shots up at the rim whereas like preseason first few games of the season He's just trying to get the ball up on the on, on the rim as quick as he can. Whereas now he's taking more of his time. You just see the development in real time. And he hasn't even played 10 games yet. And the fact that within his first 10 games, he almost had a five by five game already. Like he, he almost had a five by five. By five. Like yeah, almost, yeah. So it's just a matter of time, I think, before he does get that five by five game, which has only been done a couple of times by very few all time greats. Um, and it's crazy to say that I expect him to do it at some point in his career. It could even happen this year for all I know. But yeah, no, I, I can't say enough good things about Azar. And uh, yeah, no, I'm excited to see him uh, grow as a player because ceiling is really the limit, you know. That's why for me, Don, I selfishly need Jada Ivy to be back in the lineup. Because to me, it's like the vision of Detroit for me, right, is a team that is athletic can get downhill quickly, has multiple good enough connected passers with a defensive focus. And to me, like Ivy, Cade, Duran, Thompson, right? Like all of these guys together, you can see the vision because the way that Ivy attacks the basket, even though he's not efficient yet, you can see that he has a natural first step. And comparing that with Thompson, who's also athletic, but has the frame for defense. Like him and Cade can be like your wing type players that take defensive possessions all the time. And Duran, I mean, he, listen, Duran is special. What Duran has also started out his year, before he got hurt, of course, what he was doing mm -hmm. was ridiculous. Like 15 rebound games, five assists. That's another guy that arguably could be five by five too. Like he, he is, he's a very, very impactful player to the team. And that vision just makes a lot of sense, especially when you you think of what Duran is doing at 19. He's 19, right? Yeah, he's 19 years old for, I want to say, another month. Or no, a couple more days, probably, I'd say. A couple more weeks, maybe. But yeah, yeah. it's supposed to be his rookie year because he reclassified, right? So he graduated high school a year early and then went to Memphis and went in the, uh, into the league. Last year, he was the youngest player in the NBA, of course. The youngest player in the NBA. And in year two... What he was already doing at the start of the season. Like, walk me through your thoughts about him. Yeah, so sometimes I have to put it into, into perspective of how, like, not normal it was for him to be this productive. Um, because really, when you think about it, this was supposed to technically be his rookie year if he graduated high school like a normal person instead of reclassifying. And just, like, his physical profile at that age is absolutely insane. The thing that he's not even as his, like, athletic peak is unfathomable and then also on top of that i mean he's just a really smart player he knows how he knows how to make the right plays he's a really good he's a really skilled passer um and that's something that could definitely be a huge weapon and you know the short roll game with him and Cade. um yeah i know and i think he just fits the vision like you said that detroit's trying to build right now and that's surrounding Cade with these athletic uh guys who can play make and do stuff with the ball in their hands um because you have Ivy, Azar, and Duran, like you said, and all three of those guys, I mean, potentially are going to be able to, like, do stuff with the ball in their hands. And that allows Cade to also use his versatility and be off the ball in those situations, too. So it makes him super dynamic as an offense. And then, yeah, defensively, Duran, I mean, with his physical profile and how smart of a player he is, sky's the limit with him defensively, too. I think he's definitely a guy that could be all defensive uh, down the line. Now there's some things he obviously needs to clean up, but he's so young, like 19 years old. Like when he's on his second contract, I believe he'll be 22. <laughs> like it's it's unreal when you put it into perspective. That's crazy. Uh, so 
and he's probably what seven years away from his prime at least so who knows who knows uh i think he's only showing us glimpses of the future what he possibly could be but yeah that's uh i think he's i hate to say everyone's i hate to sound like a homer and be like oh this guy has star potential but i when he's yeah. that when he's that productive at that age it's hard to say that he's not he doesn't have that type of potential I like what you said when you focused on how you viewed him as a smart basketball player, because it's not him just being this super athletic guy who like leans on that to be super duper successful. The passing game is there. Understanding rotations is there. And the number one thing that plagues big men when they're coming into the league is foul trouble. Understanding how to stay out of foul trouble and not like always be overzealous and go for every block and go for every single steal. Like he plays super within the defensive scheme. He's super disciplined. But beyond that, he has the athleticism to make up for some shortcomings if he gets beat on the occasional rotation. And I like what you said too, because in the short roll, because he can pass, passing to him as a roller in a space floor, hypothetically, right? We're now yeah. talking about a guy that can actually take advantage of that situation by dotting the corner or passing back to Cade or passing to a guy that's cutting from the corner for like a lob, right? Like that's what he could potentially do on top of just slamming over anyone because he's also done that as well. Like that type of versatility makes the vision make sense. And I want to say for me, like, we got to see what Ivy can become. I hear that. But I think Cade is vers versatile enough to where he can be the point or be off ball. And I think that that perspective to Cade's game is why Ivy and Cade could work in terms of changing pace and having a, you know, up and down type of tempo. So that vision with those two Durin as like the roller passer Swiss Army knife guy on defense. And then you have Asura Thompson as a guy that could potentially be like your point of attack wing defender. So now you're telling me, okay, mm -hmm. Asura Thompson and Jalen Durin guard pick and rolls. That's scary. Right? Like yeah, no, the, the, potential, uh, the potential is definitely high. Potential is definitely high. And I mean, Detroit fans, obviously, like they love defense. I mean, that's what all of our great teams have been built on is defense. Yep. And that's one way one way you can build that identity, I think, is through those two guys for sure. And then, of course, can't forget about Isaiah Stewart. You know, he's the heart and soul of the team, whether or not he's starting or off the bench. But they all play a big role in that. I will never forget Isaiah Stewart, LeBron James. Like that, 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 that moment will always make me an Isaiah Stewart fan because the way that he just brings energy to the team and he's like, about that shit on the court like re really really wants to win and he's empowering his teammates that's a huge thing but also the way that he's been working on his game on the court like the spacing that he might potentially be able to bring to the Pistons as well it's a work in progress obviously but I like yeah. players that are like trying to sacrifice for the team so shout out to him for doing that um I'm curious about if you're high on him as a potential spacer at the power forward spot or not um, I'd say I do believe in the shot long term and a lot of that has to do with his work ethic and seeing how much it's already grown since he came into the league um, like the most like his rookie year he flashed a little bit of shooting I think he shot he shot really well from mid range his rookie year uh, second year he started taking them a little bit more down the stretch of the season didn't really take a lot then last year he like basically tripled his volume and maintained his percentages which is some people might not like look at it as major improvement but when you're tripling your volume that's pretty hard to do and then coming out the gate this year i mean it's a little confirmation bias but i mean he's shooting i think above 40 percent from three right now through the first seven games uh my only issue with this shooting right now is maybe he's not shooting enough because <laughs> uh, he needs to be a little bit more reluctant to take those shots when he's open. And obviously, like you said, right now it's still a work in progress for him being a spacer. And it's gonna take a long stretch of him shooting like this for defense to actually respect it. But I definitely believe in it happening in the long term. Yeah, it's it's all about you shooting like that for a long size, of course, but it's also about your mentality towards the shot, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're hesitating a lot 
defenses are like, okay, I don't, I don't care because you're not confident to shoot the shot. If you're taking it, make or miss no matter what. And even if he's like a 36% guy, if the volume is there, teams are going to respect it more. If you're sitting yeah. there unsure of, okay, should I shoot? Should I not? And that's what I think Monty can actually help the team out with a, a lot because those Suns team, the reason why they were so good is a lot of their players had quick decision making. I'm going to shoot the ball. I'm going to cut. I'm going to drive. Like that, those are the areas that I think Monty can help out with. But the adjustments offensively, I mean, th this is going to be a defensive minded team first. I agree with that. But you still have to be competent offensively. You, you can't have success by just being mid to terrible on the offensive end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now, <laughs> Isaiah Stewart is Cade's best shooter in the starting lineup. He's the best spacer. Like, that. that's unacceptable yeah. to me. And he's not even a spacer. All right, so, at least right now, like, there's some moments, like, uh, in the Golden State game, he had, like, what, three threes? So, he just needs to let it fly a little bit more, like you said, not hesitating. Um, and also, a big area of growth for him this year, too, is has been his passing. He's still not always making the read quick enough, but he's he's been making the right read a lot of times. So, I mean, that's a huge, big part of his growth. And definitely you need that in Monty's system. Like you said, the 0.5 offense that Monty likes to run. You have to make the decision of whether or not you're going to drive, pass, or shoot 0.5 seconds. Do one of the, And I think Stu, is for, he has some moments where he lapses on that, but for the most part he's been really good this year and uh i can't really complain about him this year at all yeah he he is another one of those guys that really puts the work on on his game and i, I love that detroit has more than one of these guys because again as you said thompson is literally just like that where like he wants to work on his game he wants to get better he's trying to take those strides to become a much better basketball player but the athleticism and the skill and the confidence of detroit's core is something that could be very very good my only issue is bro seeing k get double teamed or triple teamed in multiple spots of these situations it's not gonna pan out well if you're trying to have success but at the same time, it's a long season. I mean, we're still very early into the season. I think I've seen Detroit play very, very hard for sure, but they're not like a fully healthy team at the current moment. Once guys get back, I think we'll have a much better vision slash roadmap for what things are gonna look like. But as someone who covers the team, I wanna ask you, so for you coming in, what was your vision and what's your expectation for Detroit this season? So coming in, my vision was that Cade and Ivy were going to be like the leading backcourt for sure. And that Cade was going to have an all-star type of season and that they would contend for the plan, which I think are all fair expectations um, for, you know, Cade, Ivy, the team as a whole. Uh, I expected, you know, growth from all the young guys. Azar, uh, oddly enough, his defense hasn't really shocked me all that much surprisingly uh i did a round table article on uh for the fleet and uh i talked about the expectations for the season and i said that i expected azar to be a reason why we can be competitive def defensively every single night even though on paper it might not look like we'll be a great defensive team or we have no chance at it but i said that azar could be close to an all defensive caliber guy coming in and he's done absolutely that so um, and with the injuries and stuff and how the years started, the expectations have fluctuated a little bit. Um, maybe cause I think I had them winning 36, 35 games, maybe a few less than that. Now, um, depending on how bad that boy on injury is and stuff like that, cause the vets are really crucial to making this all work and gel together because they're the ones who provide the spacing. They're the ones who just like, you know, can set the tone and slow things down and make sure things just don't get out of control. You know, that's why you go get a Monte Morris kind of guy. That's why you have Boyan. That's why you got Joe Harris, you know. Um, so, yeah, those are my expectations. I'd say is like around 30 wins now. And maybe, maybe they could still contend for the plan. We'll see. I don't think that's a crazy bar to have 
for Detroit. For me personally, I looked at this team and I said, they're still super young. Uh, Cade got injured the majority of last year. So really, this is Cade's second season. I'm not really going to count those few couple games that he played. He's a very good player, but getting those reps for the longer season matters to me more than anything this season. To me, mm -hmm. Cade's development as a player should be the number one priority. And if that means you're putting better spacers around him, then you have to figure that out. Because to me, Cade is is going to be like the key Pete. Like Cade is the guy that you're hoping to be the number one option or like the number one player for this team moving forward. So him having the games to get, you know, under his belt, like, okay, I understand how to pass out of these traps quickly. Okay, th that wasn't the right choice. I should have did this. You only get those through feel. And I keep telling people, in my opinion, right? Let me know if you disagree or not, but Cade's best stretch of his career came later in the season, his rookie year, when he was like averaging, I think 20 points, he was shooting 36% from, from a three on good volume. And he was like playing the number one defense in the jazz. And he was like messing them up in that game at a very high level. But that came from him playing a lot of games and making a lot of mistakes early on before that stretch. For K to have a similar arc like that this year, all that matters is that he's playing the games and he's learning more on the fly. That's all I want to see. Like the development of the decision making for Cade and other young players on that team to really go through the ringer and experience that for a season. Hopefully not too many injuries barring that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think uh, the thing that's gotten lost in all of it too with Cade's expectations is that um, it was always possible that it was going to take some time for him to get back from his injury, like get reacclimated to the NBA because it's been a while since he's actually played regular season basketball. So uh, I definitely think they need to give him, you know, fans in general should give him a little bit of leeway in terms of that and let him actually get his feet under him. And then of course, always take into consideration the situation he is playing in. Listen, but I going in too, mm -hmm. it was fair to assume it was going to be better than it has been. I mean, you can't think that you're going to have Killian Hayes starting over Jaden Ivey before the season starts. I, w I wouldn't have guessed that, okay? That would not have been on my bingo card at all, Don. So, no. Yeah, no, my guess was that, I mean, I was assuming Killian might not even be in the rotation going yeah. into this season, let alone starting. If you would have told me that, like, a month and a half ago, I wouldn't believe you. <laughs> no, um, I think the tough part, too, right, is... The reason why I'm so focused on K playing basketball is because when you get injured, you're away from the game and you're spending time rehabbing to get back to the game, not getting better, not like improving areas, but trying to get back to the game. So to me, like this should be his bounce back year to have the sophomore year. My like like harsher expectation for K will come in year four and not three based off that circumstance. Because when you miss an entire season of basketball, it's hard for me to say, okay, bet. So you should come back here now and be elite. I can't, yeah, no. no, you know? Yeah, no, I kind of just based my, well, based my expectations for K2 of what I've seen from the 12 games last year. He started off super slow. He was probably dealing with the shin, I'd imagine too, at that point too already. I think he said it's been a nagging injury since high school, which is crazy to think about. But uh, he had like a four or five game stretch where he, he's playing the Bucks defense, killing them. Played the Hawks, killing DeJounte Murray. It literally felt like no one could guard him in that five. They killed the Warriors, beat him. Didn't matter who was guarding him. I think he was averaging like... I was at that game, by the way. 25 and 8 or something like that in yeah, that was stretch. Good. Something crazy. Um... And then he obviously fell off towards like the last two, three games and then went out with injury like we all seen. But I seen what he was capable of in that small stretch where he's just absolutely taking over games. And then even this year so far, we've seen flashes of it to where maybe he falls off towards the tail end of a game. But even that first game against Miami this year, 30, I think he had 30 and 10. This absolute monster of a game. Um... He had a great game. Who else against him? I'm 
I can't forget what other great games he had this year, but he had a few other great games. Uh, his only issue right now is, you know, getting to the line more, of course, and making sure that three balls a little bit more consistent. But then again, I also think that has to do with getting his legs under him too and, con and conditioning. Also, the Pistons have had <laughs> bad luck with their schedule. I, I believe six out of seven of their games have been involved in a back-to-back, -back, which is <laughs> yeah. pretty ridiculous. It feels like they're playing every day. Um, the NBA needs to do something about that. I don't know why they would do that to us, but it's unfortunate. But given the circumstances and stuff, yeah, no. Um, I still think Cade, you know, at the end of the year, I think things are going to be pretty clear with Cade and that he is going to be like the franchise player and that he is going to be a star player for sure. I'm 100% with you there. Uh, there's a couple final things I want to ask you because you watch more Detroit Hoops than me, so you're going to know exactly about these players. But as someone who's from Detroit, that's a Warriors fan, which is weird because I started yeah. watching basketball when they started playing whatever, yada, yada, yada. When I went to the game, Umode? I hope I... Stanley Umode. Dude, he looked elite. <laughs> like, okay, is he a real player to you? Or, like, what do you think, like, him... Roden, maybe Sasser too. Like, are these guys like guys that you think can really contribute for this team, or do you think they're more so just here because of who's not there right now? So I think Stanley Amude. I mean, he played because of who wasn't there right now. But Stanley Amude, if you're watching the uh, Pistons preseason basketball at all, which I don't know why you would be, but um, I mean, he he was knocking down everything. He just looks like an elite shooter. I, I believe last year in the G League, too, he was shooting like 39% from three, something like that. So the kid can shoot. He's only 22 years old, played at the University of Arkansas, I believe. So, yeah, no, I think he could definitely be a real player. And I think the biggest thing, too, when you look at guys that are coming from the G League or on two-way contracts is the type of confidence that they play, play with. Um, Stanley Amude coming into the game last night, his career high in an actual NBA game was two points. And he went out there and was looking for his shot and put a uh, pole in it like he was he's been out there for years, you know, and against the Golden State Warriors, who I'm sure he looks up to as a team. You know, uh, we've both seen them, you know, win so many championships and stuff like that. So I would imagine that in his situation, it'd probably be easy to get caught in the bright, uh, bright lights and not perform. But. He just looks calm, cool, and collected the entire time. And I think that's huge for a player like him. And if that shooting is real, I mean, I think he definitely could have a spot on the team. Yeah, he, and be he a just, real player. like, I haven't seen him before this game. I'll just be honest. And I'm mm -hmm. watching it, and it's like, he looked so confident. He mm -hmm. shot the ball, like, at a very high level, even with closeouts from length and good defenders. And he just like, I'm like, damn, that that's the answer. Like, play like play guys like that that space. But, but you know, obviously it's still early on into the season. But even a guy like Sasser, who was like making good decisions from times, I mean, it kind of speaks to the potential depth that you guys could have with these guys. But again, I mean, you're really seeing what these players are, are made of more because obviously there's so many key vets who are out right now, but he looked like a guy that could really help the spacing problems for Detroit. Yeah, honestly, like Sasser too, he can play defense. So if if Monty wants to stick with, uh, we're setting like a defensive tone with a starting lineup, whatever. I've publicly said it before that I think Marcus Sasser should be starting instead of, you know, Killian Hayes, for example, because you have an actual scoring threat. He can create his own shot. He can create for others to a certain extent, but he's not usually, he's usually just hunting for his own shot. But he's right. a great shooter. He's shooting over 50% from three right now, which obviously isn't sustainable. But he was also an elite shooter uh, at Houston, too. Uh, he was a four-year player. He was arguably the best player on the best team in the country in college. He's definitely a real player. Uh, he's already exceeded expectations, I think. Um, many people had a lot of concerns about how small he is and stuff like that. But offensively, the guy can get a bucket. Um and he's only 22 years old. I know that's, that's old for a rookie, but I think age tends to get a little bit overrated. I think the NBA experience definitely matters a little bit more. So uh, long term, he could definitely be a guy that where he's like your six go to six man. 
at the very least i think that's what he's shown so far okay well for you moving forward assuming Durant comes back healthy what would be your starting lineup for the pistons so my ideal starting lineup would be Cade, ivy azar boyan and Duran. if everyone's healthy if everyone's healthy so obviously they'd probably struggle a bit defensively but Boyan's just too good of a shooter or a shooter and scorer to just leave out of that starting lineup you need that ivy you know he brings a secondary creation next to Cade. he can also score the ball at a really high level um and then you got a czar defensive wing can play poa and then Cade's also a really good defensive wing too um and then Duran too so those three guys can maybe help make your defense somewhat competitive so you're not completely drowning on that end but i think that's like the best balance that you can get and you get a mix of the veteran presence and the youth instead of what we have now where we have the youngest starting lineup in the entire nba i think what stands out to me with the lineup you just said is it's a good mix of athleticism and passing for pretty much every position pretty much every guy out there can pass the shooting might be a bit spotty, but again, you have Boyan who can shoot off the bounce and also can run off of uh, pin downs. You have uh, strong guys who can set good screens and also rebound the ball. And in transition, I mean, that's the key to what Ivy and Cade could really unlock, especially with Boyan taking catch and shoot threes in transition. I mean, that that would maximize your offense better, too. So and, and it's hard, too. Azar too with oh, his yeah. full court passing. That's like one of my favorite aspects of his game too. Is when he gets a board, he can he can literally just throw the ball down the court and find someone. Um, and then also another thing too is the reason why I wouldn't be too worried about the shooting is I really believe in Ivy as a shooter. I mean, so far this year he shot the ball great, and then even last year too, I believe it was like in the 80, 80th, eighty fifth percentile in terms of uh, catch and shoot three point percentage. Um, so obviously playing next to Katie, he's going to get more of those looks than he did last year. Uh, pull up shooting. It's looked really good this year, but it's still early. So to be determined, but I, and he can also shoot off a movement too. So I think it's, yeah, no, that's, it's the most ideal lineup in my opinion. Hopefully we get a chance to actually see this lineup at some point. Um, I hope that Monty isn't fully committed to, to Killian Hayes being the, long-term season starter um i still think there's value that you can see from killian but i think it needs to be in smaller doses considering who else you have on the roster to play over him i think but uh great way to explain your expectations for the pistons this is a team that i'm, I'm going to be going to a, a lot of games for i'm excited yeah. to be watching pistons hoops okay last year i'll be honest i watched some here or there I went to some games here or there, but the vision of what they're trying to do really draws me in, even if my eyes might be bleeding from game to game. I'm here for yeah. it now. Yeah, 17 win season last year. It was rough, I'm not gonna lie. I don't know. There must be something wrong with me for watching every single game, but <laughs> it definitely uh, had some long lasting damage, I'd, uh, I'd say. If you heard that, there's no way that you're not tapping in to Dom. Make sure to tap into Pistons Fleet. Again, I'm going to be in those spaces a lot more now, listening to the team and things of that nature. So make sure to tap in. Sure. Also, Don has a Twitter, so all of his links will be in the description and the comment section below. Don, I appreciate having you on this episode of Gifted Hoops. I'm actually happy this happened because we did spend like a good five or six days saying, okay, we'll pod here. I'm tired. Yeah. Okay, we'll pod here. You're tired. We got a lot of things going on right now, but having this conversation, I was very excited for, and hopefully some at some point in the offseason, we can basically reflect on how this full season went because it's a long season. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for having me. And I would love to do a, another pod sometime. Bet. I enjoyed this. Bet. And shout out to Don, y'all, because this is actually Don's first ever podcast. I want to say you killed it. Great insight. You know ball. You were able to communicate effectively about ball. We appreciate those. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, if you made it this far, make sure to tap into the Gift News Podcast again on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and the YouTube side of things. Content will be ramping up. I've been 
very stretched out because I've been watching a ton of basketball, but not talking about it as much. But I'm going to have a much more layered perspective. Again, these episodes are going to be dropping on Mondays and Thursdays. The goal is to be 3 p.m. on both of those days consistently. So expect this to drop. I'm going to wait to drop this for Thursday to stay true to my word. But Don, appreciate you. Everybody tap in and appreciate Hoops. Hoops is at a premium right now beyond just the Pistons. Basketball has been good pretty much overall this season. So make sure to appreciate the sport. Get out of the agenda. Save those for the offseason. We love those. And I'll catch you guys in the next official upload of the Get the Hoops podcast. Peace out, everybody. Have a good one.